Welcome, and I'll call the July 17th Town Council meeting to order. Would you please stand with me in honoring America? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, Roll call. Councilor Roy. Here. Councilor Holbrook. Here. Councilor Sullivan. Here. Councilor St. Clair. Here. Councilor Blaze. Here. Councilor Benedict. Here. Chairman Offlis. Here. Item four is our general public comments. This is your opportunity to come up and stand at the podium. Give us your name and address, and we'll give you three minutes to um, state your comments, whatever you want to say. So first one wants to say something, just step right up. Yep, go ahead. Name and address, please. My name is Kevin Grondon, 115 Beach Ridge Road, and I know it's not on the docket tonight or anything like that, but it was out there for it to be on tonight about the memorial thing, and I was just coming to like state some like point of views on it or anything like that in case it comes back up again on like rules on it. Like I could see if someone, if there's a memorial site for someone that passes away, that they take in, um Someone has to put their name on like the site that's responsible to make sure it keeps clean under certain guidelines of like no leaving trash down there, no like harmful objects, glass bottles or anything like bad like a cross and flowers and maybe like a little garden but like mine has down there in uh, Scarborough Downs. But like and if they don't keep track of it then they take and the town will go towards them and like give them a warning. Then if they don't clean it up after a certain time, they give them another warning. If they don't clean up at that point in time, then they take and the town can remove it at that point in time. So there's like some sort of guidelines on it so that there isn't like trash or anything like that left on somewhere or it's like some sort of respectable, like respectable shrine, memorial, of however it's put out there so that it doesn't cause an issue in the town or anything because I don't really want to have it come up and like have some massive issue or anything like that or people go and then upset or cause I've had a lot of people come to me and email me, calling me, text me about when it came up the first time and the rules or whatever was put out there. Everyone had different like standpoints on it but if like you got put together in like an organized way and like put out there like something like that, I think it might be a little sort of better maybe. I don't know. I'm not a public no. speaker, so. No, no, very good. Thank you for your comments. Thank you. So, uh, next person to speak, just stand right up uh, to the podium, please, and your name and address would be great. You have three minutes. My name is Kay Dillon, 382 Black Point Road, and I, I don't know Kevin, and he doesn't know me, but I know his family. And uh, having had so many of these students in school over the years in Scarborough and South Portland, Unfortunately, I've known a bunch of these uh, crosses and the families. And I just feel I support Kevin in his restrictions that he's presented to you. I uh, don't like the flags, uh, the balloons hanging, in, and they are a di distraction for the driver. But I just wanted to say to anybody that sees any of the crosses, say a prayer and keep on going. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next one. Somebody else would like to speak? No, oh, you're all set. Yeah, go ahead. Name and address, please. Yeah, three minutes. Um, my name is Peter Hornby. I am a friend of Scarborough. I am not a Scarborough resident. I come from Ocean Park, 56 Randall Avenue. Our family's been here for 100 summers. Um, unless you run in the photography cultures, the American painter Winslow Homer, um, or other circles that I happen to engage in, you probably don't know me. I'm a professional location photographer. I travel all over North uh, America, all over the North Atlantic, and England and Scotland. Um, I'm here wearing two hats. The first thing I want to share with you is about eight days ago, three miles from here, I was almost killed in a head-on traffic accident on that in front of the soda bottling plant over on Western Avenue. And uh, I was very um, tr 
troubled by that. My mother, a few, about eight, nine years ago, was rear-ended by a drunk driver on her way returning from Maine on the Mass Pike. Guy rear-ended her at over 100 miles an hour. I'm here today to speak for people that don't necessarily have a voice. I think these shrines and markers are very important for one reason and one reason only, because they are markers that something terribly wrong has happened in these locations. And I see these all over North America. I see them in Britain. I see them in Canada. The road, the road is the most dangerous thing that you and I engage in during our lives. I'm a semi-retired adventurer. I climb Mount McKinley in Alaska, walk the Appalachian Trail. Um, I have a plethora of things in my dossier that are rather curious. But driving on the road is the number one dangerous thing. And I think these little shrines, although some people see them as being rather cheesy, and I'm sorry to use that adjective uh, relative to this, they are remembrances of these events that have occurred there. And so I am an advocate for these being left alone. Um, I think if these are challenged, it's very disrespectful to the people that died and the people that had um, the memory of these individuals who want to note that this occurrence took place. Um, I guess that's the heart of the matter. Obviously, um, uh, I found out about this through the television and the newspapers. I drove by this location three years ago when this group of individuals was there um, observing this occurrence. and. Um, I just felt compelled this evening to come and share with you my thoughts. Thank you. Thank you very much. Who else would like to speak? Um, anybody else? Thank you for your thoughts. Um, we're sorry the council apologized. If there was any uh, miscommunication or any confusion, we certainly didn't want to put regulations in. It was just uh, a helpful policy, something that would be helpful to the family and friends. And you certainly have some uh, great input on that, and we appreciate that. So, again, thank you for uh, coming tonight and sharing your thoughts. We appreciate it. Next item is the minutes from the June 19th meeting. Is there a motion? Move approval. Second. Any comments? Seeing none, all those in favor? It's a vote. Any adjustments to the agenda? Seeing none, items to be signed. We'll do that through the meeting. Uh, first order of business. Order number 1352 is a 7 p.m. public re hearing and second reading on the amendments to Chapter 405, the Town of Scarborough Zoning Ordinance, with regards to reformatting the sign regulations. Step right up, and you're going to give us a little. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Jay Chase. I'm the assistant planner in town. Um, I'll be presenting a, a few of the items before you tonight. Um, I know you've had a presentation and proposal on the sign amendments before you, and so I'll, I'll give a, an, an overview for those who aren't aware of the initiative to date. Um, over the course of the last uh, several months, planning staff, along with staff from SEDCO, have been working with the Ordinance Committee to make this, the sign section of the zoning ordinance easier to use, navigate, and frankly a little bit more understandable than it is to, at date. Um, to do that, we've uh, sought to eliminate conflicts throughout the provisions in the sign regulations. Um, you know, again, as I said, the overall goal is to make the sign provisions easier and more straightforward at the time of application for customers who are looking to install or amend an existing sign. Um, to that end, the proposal before the council tonight, largely a reorganization of the existing standards. We've moved frequently used sections to the forefront of the um, subsection of the ordinance, uh, such as the general standards for signs, the sign uh, size chart, and moved uh, other items such as definitions, regulations about non-conforming signs, 
uh, and the like to the rear of the, of the ordinance. Um, further, we've um, tried to modernize some of the language, as I stated, as well as um, make the language more coordinated because in working with the sign or uh, provisions, staff and others have found some conflicts and so we've tried to, um, again, coordinate the language throughout, um, which is always a good thing. Um, Let's see, I guess I'll just you know, end by let, uh, mentioning that the planning board held a public hearing on the item. I believe you have minutes that reflect that. Generally, the planning board was supportive of the overall changes. Um, they did mention two, two items they'd like the council to consider. One, um, the planning board was not in favor of adding what is now referenced as B number 27. It's a section refer relating to um, gas prices and the color of the signs. Um, the other item that the planning board uh, mentioned, uh, sought council to reconsider, was to amend the existing language that allows a reader board to be added to a non-conforming sign. Um, they they uh, thought it would be a good, this might be an ample a good time to think about striking that provision, um, and that one can be found on page 24 of the proposal, it's section K2F. It's the paragraph after F. Um, with that, oh. Um, I should, uh, one thing I, I'm sorry I failed to mention, in the reorganization, one of the uh, big items that was accomplished as well was the Haggis Parkway District had its own subsection within the sign ordinance that was established when the Haggis Parkway zone was established 10 years ago or so. Um, and with the recent updates to the Haggis Parkway that this council, the Haggis Parkway District, I should say, that this council adopted to make that zone um, uh, more in line with our other general commercial zones, it was felt that this would be a good time to fold the Haggis Parkway sign regulations into the rest of the uh, provisions. There was an item that we just recently noted that was missed. In the Haggis Parkway, the Haggis Parkway has a very large right of way. Oftentimes it exceeds upwards of 150 feet. The Haggis Parkway has allowed a zero foot setback no setback front lines for freestanding signs where all our other zones require a, a uh, have a variable setback, if you will. Um, and so um, if we've provided uh, some language that um, considers a, maintaining that zero setback and that's been provided through the town manager, and, um, we think that may be considered this evening as well. With that, I turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, uh, this is Order 13-52. This is a public hearing, uh, and I will open the public hearing. Is there anybody from the public who would like to speak on this matter? Step right up. Name and address. Nobody. Last chance. I'll close the public hearing, and what's the pleasure of the council. This is the second reading on this matter. Council Roy. I would move approval. And I'll offer an amendment. Uh, order 1352, second? Anybody second that? Second. Discussion? Yep. Council Sullivan. Are these, um, um, what we have in front of us, is this what the council discussed along with the planning department without any omissions from the um, planning board? Correct. The uh, planning board is just simply advisory. We relate that to you, but the draft before you is what was uh, <coughs> asked in first reading, with that, and it does not incorporate those changes. Okay, thank you. Um, question on the the, um, the colors, the fuel price sign colors. Mm -hmm. um, would you clarify a little bit with that? Sure. That was a an amendment which can be found. Try to flip to the page here. Is it 27? It's subsection B, number 27. Okay. I think you'll find it on page 8, top of page 8. That's a provision that allows for um, electronic fuel price signs to currently all reader board signs, all electronic signs under our current standards either need to be gold or white lettering and numbering in this case. Um, through the ordinance committee discussion, uh, it was forwarded that uh, um, to add this provision that allows fuel prices to meet industry standards. Right now, I believe those standards are green and red, if I'm not mistaken, Correct. but the way this language is written, it allows for gas prices to meet gas price reader boards to meet the industry standards for colors. Um, and what was, the, what was the planning board's 
Objection? Um, the planning board felt that uh, for consistency's sake along the roadway, gold and white would be the preferred. I think there was also, there was also reference that when the reader board standards went in, again, some eight, ten years ago, um, there, was, there were studies that found that the gold or white lettering was less um, I'm not, um, uh, distracting to drivers and it you know, was easier to see than other colors and so that's where the gold and white lettering provision comes from and so they felt to be consistent and to, um, to having um, basically follow the recommendations of that study would be, um, that was their preference to see. Council Sullivan. Um, that's, that's one of the changes I brought forward and I, <clears throat> I disagree with that finding. Um, I've seen the white and I've seen the gold and a matter of fact when the Sitco station put their new sign in they, it came with green and red and there was another sign right down the road that had amber and I found the green and red being much more easy on the eyes than the amber or white. So I meant I don't I never found that distracting. That was my opinion uh, on the uh, ordinance committee. So I brought that forward and wanted those changes done. You know, or if the council thinks um, they want to go the other way, that's fine. Uh, Councilor Sullivan, are you making an amendment? Uh what are you proposing? No, no. I was just he, he wanted as as it is. As it is, right. is there. I, I just was curious is. as to what the yep. colors were. That's all. Yep. Um. Any other comments? Did I? Yep. Yeah. Right. I Council thought the right. council of Sullivan made it real clear. Uh, meeting ago or two meetings ago about the red and green and discussed it all with Dan Bacon, and that that was supposed to be what was going in. It is. It yes. is. It is. I was simply reflecting what the planning board had said at their hearing. Yeah, right. just that's fine. Two items I just wanted there. to know what the colors were. Um, I'd like to right. offer an amendment uh, relative to that no minimum f uh, setback for the Haggis Parkway. It would be under Section E uh, three, uh, which is it talks about uh, required minimum setbacks in the front lot line in the right of way. And uh, I would offer the amendment to add 3A that there is no minimum front lot setback required for freestanding signs from the Haggis Parkway right of way. All other dimensional requirements established in uh, Section 12C shall apply. Second. Discussion? Council Roy? Must be a reason. No, I think, well, it, the reason I think Jay spoke to it, I mean, the, we, because they have so much more right of way area that it was not going to be uh, obstructive or obtrusive uh, and we wanted to maintain that that standard for the for the Haggis Parkway. Great. Anybody else? Uh, the amendment first. All those in favor of the amendment? Opposed? It passes. Now the main motion. All those in favor of the main motion? Opposed? Oh. Next item is uh, order 13-15. Thank you. This is a 7 p.m. public hearing and second reading on the proposed amendments to Chapter 405C, the Town of Scarborough Shoreland Zoning Ordinance, to update the accessory unit standards to eliminate the requirements for public sewer and water. We have a, a brief explanation from Jay. Yep, and actually I just picked up on the fact that this references a amendment to the uh, Scarborough Shoreland Zoning Ordinance, Chapter 405C. Uh, this is really an amendment to the zoning ordinance, um, and, and I'll explain that in just a moment. Under, um, it has to do with the provisions for accessory units. Um, as most of you will likely recall, back in the winter of 2012, uh, Council updated the accessory unit allowance in the zoning ordinance to make it easier for folks to create accessory living units within single family homes. Prior to the amendment, um, the in-law apartments, as they're commonly referred to, required folks to go to our Board of Appeals for review and approval. In, you know, over the course of years, the Board of Appeals have been um, approving them readily, so it seemed 
to make sense to make the process a bit simpler for folks to make it a straightforward permitting process through our building and code enforcement folks. Um, at that time, there was an added language that came from, I believe, some model language that was looked at to require um, in-law apartments in the shoreland zone to be served by public water and public sewer. Having now worked with the ordinance over the past uh, course of the past uh, several months, as well as receiving additional information from a property owner in town and working with the ordinance committee, um, there was, we reviewed the proposal to eliminate this requirement that public water and public sewer be connected to. Uh, and the ordinance committee felt comfortable that accessory units could be accommodated on lots in the shoreland zone when served by private wells and uh, on-site water systems, provided, of course, that those lots comply with local and state plumbing codes, including lot sizes, soils, and designs of, uh, um, of the systems. Um, just mentioned that the planning board held a public hearing on this item and was fully supportive of the action. Thank you. And this is item 13-53, and it's a public hearing, so I'll open the public hearing. Is there anybody like to speak on this matter? I just had a question. Anybody? I have a question. Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing. Now we'll have a motion. I have a question. Yeah. Does this mean that on a piece of property where there's an existing house that is <laughs> serviced by public water that the attached building can have a septic? Uh, in the likely scenarios, they would have to connect into the public um, uh, um, sanitary district system. If they were adding, if they were adding an in-law apartment, they'd have to. No, it's simply allowing for sites that aren't common, co currently accommodated by the sanitary district system. That if they can again prove out that they could have a septic system of adequate size to um, control the wa on on-site waste, that they could add an accessory unit mm -hmm. on-site. <coughs> Thank you. Would you feel that the, the, rule, the rules usually, uh, being the sewer lady from um, '89? Um, that if there if there is sewage that traverses by your your home, you're obligated to connect mm -hmm. by the Scarborough Sanitary District. Do you think it should be written in there that those who have have to stay with, so we don't have multiple uses on property? I, I don't know that that's necessary. It's it's. Um, as, as was just stated by Councillor Roy, um, it is a requirement by the sanitary district. Um, there is sort of a, a, a service, I don't know if agreement is quite the right word, but a service requirement. Um, and that's certainly something that through the normal permitting process, our code officers are cognizant of. Um, so I don't know that it's necessary. It may be redundant, but certainly if the council would like to consider such language. Or Pleasure. I simply was trying to see if they thought it should be in there as a clarity to make it simple. Do we have a motion that we can have a discussion? Yeah, move yeah. approval of order 1353. Second. Thank you. Now the discussion. Anybody else would like to speak? Anybody? Uh, I, I just think that, you know, it, it's required by the sanitary district, and if the code enforcement is going to um, have to um, Review the whatever permitting the, process. the the permitting process. That's part and parcel of the permitting process that they hitch up to the the sewer or and water. I mean, it uh, it automatically happens. Or if you built an accessory unit onto an existing home, it would again need code enforcement to give an occupancy permit, and that occupancy permit would require that they be connected to water and sewer. Is, is, this, That's a place. is this strictly for shoreland zoning? What, what all this does is it strikes one line in the existing provisions. In, as, as you might see, it's so t in the ordinance, accessory units have performance standards that the code office and and the homeowner review to be sure that an accessory unit can be built. 
And right now, one of the standards, I think it's around number 13, but I could be off on that, <coughs> says simply, properties in the shoreland zone, and I'm paraphrasing, properties in the shoreland zone must connect to public water and public sewer. All this proposes to do is strike that sentence. But they'd still be subject to soil tests and other questions. Absolutely. Uh, as, they plumbing, go, yeah. uh, as they go through the building permit process, they would be subject to the review that our, our code officers, building inspectors typically go through. If it's on sanit you know, if it's on on-site uh, septic system, they would have to show that their system um, is adequately sized or that they're going to uh, uh, make improvements to the infrastructure they have on-site to adequately deal with their on-site wastewater. Thank you. Any other comments? Seeing none, all those in favor? Opposed? It's a vote. Next order. Order number 1355 is a 7 p.m. public hearing and second reading on the proposed amendments to Chapter 303, the Town of Scarborough Personnel Ordinance. And we're going to have a little... I think I'll just simply introduce it. There's not really much uh, by way of introduction. Uh, we've included uh, the amendment passed in first reading by council that's been incorporated into the draft in front of you. Jacqueline Mandrake, Human Resources Director, is here should you want to uh, get into any of the detail of the proposed changes to the ordinance, but it is intended to clean up some things that we've noticed over time, um, comply with federal law and the like, uh, and we do recommend your approval. Right. And we did remove that part that yes. we talked about. It. The draft I, I, you I know Penny Historian is listening tonight, so he'll know. Make yes, sure the draft I before you reflects what was passed in the first reading, which uh, removed that suggested uh, revision. Thank you. This is a public hearing, so I'll open the public hearing. Is there anybody who'd like to speak on this matter? If you would, step right up, name and address. You give it all the time you want. Three minutes. <laughs> Seeing none, we'll close the public hearing. What's the pleasure of the council? This is the Move second approval of order 1355. We have a second. Yeah. Comments? Any comments? Yeah. I just Holbrook. that it kind of cleans up some of the missing holes, if you will, that, that we were talking about. Um, there's just some standards in here. Employees can't have, you know, seniority over a direct family member and, and those types of things. It's all just kind of current language that's in most places of business. Um, nothing really too earth shattering, but um, just for the folks at home. Standards of conduct, ethical responsibilities, those sorts of things, all those little tidbits that are in every workplace now. Yeah. Thank you. Anybody else like to speak? Seeing none, all those in favor? Opposed? It's a vote. Under old business is order number 1341, a second reading on the proposed amendments to the Town of Scarborough official zoning map to update the zoning districts that apply to the Scarborough Downs property and adjacent properties in the vicinity of Payne Road. Jay's just going to uh, introduce this briefly. Uh, this matter has been talked about before this board um, quite often, um, but we thought we'd just at least put the zoning map um, up to help guide the conversation. I would just note the orders uh, 1341 and 42 are, are certainly hand in hand in that one is, uh, affects the zoning map change, whereas uh, the other uh, actually makes the specific language changes to land use regulations. Go ahead. Jay. Mr. Hall said much of what I was going to say. Again, uh, just a brief, a brief introduction, recognizing this has be been before this board a few times. By way of uh, brief background, as I just said, it's an initiative by the Long Range Planning Committee to update the zoning for the Scarborough Downs and the surrounding properties as shown on the map. Again, I, I think we'll be talking about this order and the order that uh, has the actual zoning change as you know, they're part and parcel. Uh, the goal of the proposal is to provide a range of activities that are consistent with the comprehensive plan and the desires of the property owners. To that end, the Long Range Planning Committee held a series of public workshops and individual meetings with property owners culminating in the proposals before you. Um, as mentioned, this item has been before the Council for both first reading and public hearing, as well as been to the Planning Board for a public hearing. And again, uh, the plan board was generally supportive of the proposed changes. Um, I just note that uh, Mark Ironman, Mr. Ironman, uh, over here to my right, is a professional consultant to the Long Range Planning Committee, who's worked most closely with Dan Bacon. Uh, and we're both here to help answer any questions uh, that the council may have. With that, I turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. 
Thank you. Before we take any council action, is there anybody here from Scarborough Downs or that area would like to speak before we get started? If you would, step right up. Yeah, we'll give you three minutes. Good evening. Um, my name is Andrew Ingalls. I'm a commercial real estate broker at uh, the Bowles Company in Portland. I've talked to you folks before. I've <laughs> I've been involved with the uh, this uh, zone change. I work with Ms. Terry and Ed McCall, the attorney for Ms. Terry. And um, we were uh, in discussions right from the get-go with the uh, long-range committee concerning the changes. Um, and in, for the most part, we were in agreement with the uh, ideas they had. Primarily, as I saw it, as a, as a broker, the, the primary changes were the change from industrial use to residential use, which we thought was a, good, a very good uh, change given the nature of the area. Um, well, the only thing I want to speak to tonight was clearly what we, what we spoke of when we first met was that the current zone clearly says no, no gaming involved. And we just asked the committee, the Long Range Committee, which uh, pass that information on to the planning board, which passes it on to you. If we could have some type of arrangement in the in the, the current zone, the new zone, which allowed for a referendum, uh, which would ask the town that, because of the nature of any type of casino uh, racino use, the state regulates the referendum is mandatory in order to do that. Uh, as I understand it, even a council vote is inadequate. So we recognize that, and what we wanted was something in the zone itself to said in the, in the event that a successful uh, referendum uh, was undertaken by the owners, then a zone change would not be necessary um, within, the, within the zone uh, itself, the zoning regulations itself, rather than having a vote which both had to change the zone and allow the Racino aspect of it. Um, you know, as I've said on several occasions, I think it's the catalyst that would drive the, the new zone, the aspects of the new zone around a master plan. Very difficult to achieve that with individual uh, contractors and developers. Um, <coughs> it would be clearly a very strong economic engine for the town. But primarily tonight, we just wanted to ask, we thought there would be a debate within the council itself because that debate did not take place within the long range plan or the planning board about just having that clause was suggested within the within the zone itself, within the right of the zone itself, that a referendum, a successful referendum would be uh, permissible to uh, go forward without a zone change. Thank, thank you. Anybody else? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, good evening. My name is Ed McCall. I'm uh, the attorney for the Downs. I reside at 78 uh, Wells Road, just across the Spurwink River in, uh, uh, in Cape. Uh, um, just to fl uh, flesh out a little bit the history here, um, you know, when the town approached Ms. Terry about redoing the zone, we explained that this was an important issue if, if harness racing is to survive in Scarborough or at all. Uh, it needs to have gaming with casino gaming uh, in Maine, and eventually the track will fail if it doesn't uh, doesn't have that opportunity. The proposal that um, we've suggested would make the most sense is actually proposed by Mr. Bacon, and, and I take it by his absence that he's on a well-earned vacation this evening. Um, but he sent around some language that we looked at back in February. We said that's that's perfect. We certainly recognize there needs to be a referendum before this can go forward. We've had refer referenda in the town in the past and we failed. We certainly would not ask the council to overrule the will of the people unless the people decide to overturn uh, their own decision. But in the past, and I drafted the earlier questions, we've had, we have had to ask the double question that Andrew referenced. Do you want to both change the zoning ordinance and also approve this, this thing under, this, under the statute? and we end up with a complicated question. And our experience is that at least some voters look at a referendum question, and if they don't understand on the first read through, the answer is no. So we hope that with this own change, the voters will get, if there is another referendum, and we're not now asking for another referendum, but if there is one, they'll get a simpler question that won't be 
that then confusion of the voters won't affect the outcome, and, and, and then the council will have the voters' actual will based on a clearly stated question under an existing zoning law that would allow the use if but only use, if but only if there is, there is a successful referendum and a revenue sharing agreement that the council would approve. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else want to speak? Yep. Separate up <coughs> name and address. Three minutes. Good evening, Karen Vachon. I live at 25 Ocean Ave at Hagen's Beach in Scarborough. And I just want to make sure that the language is clear in, in the zoning to include electronic gaming, casino style gambling um, with, with Scarborough Downs so that when the referendum does come before the people, the people are clear about what, what that is. And I just want to make sure that the language is clear. So I thank you. Thank you. Anybody else would like to speak on this matter? Seeing none, what's the pleasure of the council? Councilor St. Clair. Yes, Chairman Elquist. I would actually move to table this discussion. Tabling is non-debatable. All those in favor of tabling the question? Till table completely till when? or till no, another? No, um, we'll until Dan's back from vacation and we can look into this a little bit um, more. Right. I'd like a little bit more information before I vote on something. So would it be the so August making, meeting? I make, would yes, yes. August I think meeting, we can be prepared okay. for the yep. August meeting. We have okay. a couple weeks. So I would actually ask that we table order number 1341. Please. Thank okay. you. All those in favor? Opposed? It's a vote. Order number 1342 is the second meeting on the proposed amendments to Chapter 405, the Town of Scarborough Zoning Ordinance, to establish a new zoning district specific to the Scarborough Downs property entitled the Crossroads Plan Development District. Anybody from the public like to speak? I think we already did. Mostly in uh, chair. Might I suggest you could hold a public hearing uh, this evening to dispense with it. Uh, actually, you don't. No, I take no. your part. No, there's um, second reading, yeah. Um, nobody from the public would like to speak. Councilor Chair recognize, recognizes Councilor St. Clair. Yes, I would also like to move uh, that we table order number 1342 until our next August meeting. Second. Second. All those in favor? It's a vote. Next order. Thank you. Order under new business. Oh. <laughs> I'm opposed. Uh, you no, know, we know that. I'm going to lean back a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was looking the other way. I figured that was that. <laughs> I saw you. I just got the, I just got the vibe there. So. Thank you. Yep. Under new business, order number 1357 is the first reading and schedule a second reading to amend the fiscal year 2014 budget as follows. Increase excise tax, re tax revenues by $350,000 from $3,850,000 to $4.2 million. million sorry. Decrease municipal revenue sharing revenue by $326,432 from $1.1 million to 782,212. Increase general purpose school aid by $788,038 from $3,471,253 to $4,259,291. Increase school employer re retirement appropriations by $520,200. $520,283 for a total school education growth budget change from $38,954,233 to $39,474,516. Thank you. Before we go any further, I'll ask the town, uh, the town uh, manager. Very simply, the, essentially, of, as the clerk read, uh, there are three components that um, we're considering this evening that were a function, are a function of the state budget uh, finalization, those being um, the municipal revenue sharing, uh, additional general purpose aid to education, and of course the additional expense for teacher retirement costs. And while you're considering an amendment in those three regards, we also suggest you consider the excise tax, though that wasn't entirely uh, a function of the state budget, it's just our projections have uh, gotten a little better if there was a component related to the final state budget as well. Uh, what really brings us together is the uh, approval of the additional appropriation, and what comes with that is what I think is the very good news of uh, a bit of a windfall, I would say, of additional GPA from the state for education. Um, 
this body might recall a workshop in these chambers with the school board uh, when this matter was discussed, and I distinctly recall that evening that there was some conjecture that we might actually lose GPA uh, in the final analysis. So this is certainly welcome news, um, and I think helps ease the pain. The net effect of the proposed amendments before you this evening would reduce the uh, tax commitment by $291,323, $291, which equates to about an 8% reduction in the tax rate. Um, I'm certainly pleased to go into uh, more detail uh, about any of these factors if you like. Just a final point of reference, I distributed for your review a copy of the action the school board took <coughs> past Monday evening, uh, July 15th, uh, that dealt with at least the two school-related issues, uh, just so you see what they, what they did earlier this week. Uh, obviously, we do have representatives from the school here, perhaps they have some input as well. Yep. Next, I'll ask, is there anybody from the public who would like to speak on this matter? Please step right up, state your name, and do you have any comments? Seeing none, this is the first reading. Um, what's the pleasure of the council? Um, uh, would you like to hear from the school? I think yeah, they don't know that. Yeah. I think you Yeah, sure. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I thought we... Uh, no, um, I'll be referencing the, uh, the poster here. Uh, good evening. I'm George Entwistle. I'm the superintendent of schools here in Scarborough. Uh, tonight we are back with some unanticipated good news, as the um, manager said, from the state and from the Department of Education. As you'll remember, a roughly $624,000 reduction in the school budget was uh, made by the town council on May 1st the bulk of which reflected the removal from the expenditure side of the school budget an estimated $520,000 of anticipated cost shift from the state to the town of Scarborough. It was recognized at that time that if the main PERS, which is the teacher retirement expenditure, uh, became mandated by law, the school board and the town council would need to come back together and amend the budget accordingly. And so here we are. In a response to the cost shifting from the state to the towns and to help offset the impact on the towns, the state legislature has allocated additional dollars, um, approximately $28.1 million. Like all state allocations to the public schools, this money is apportioned according to the essential programs and services formula what we all know to be the EPS formula. We in Scarborough were cautioned not to expect, as the manager also referenced, that our share of the new revenue would likely even offset half of the $520,000 bill that the state has now handed to us. Uh, please allow me to just take a couple of minutes um, as a departure from this presentation to address um, an unfortunate and uh, but very unintentional oversight in providing an explanatory note to the council related to Scarborough's previous uh, subsidy calculation for FY 2014, which is also derived um, by way of the EPS formula. You see a fully recognized root cause of great confusion and consternation uh, since the time of its inception is EPS the State Department of Education's formula that is intended to provide an understandable and equitable mechanism for distributing state funds uh, to schools. The EPS formula, however, has proven to be, on virtually all levels, neither understandable nor credible. 
Um, through the town manager, I know that you've all received the chronology that has been put together uh, by finance and business manager for the school's Kate Bolton re related to the FY 2014 EPS calculations and the impact on those calculations of the school department's application of federal job grant funds. Let me give it to you in, a, uh, in nutshell form. Uh, with the best interests of the town in mind, the school board back in 2010, while following the guidance of state officials in charge of administering these federal funds for the state of Maine, applied grant monies to cover salaries and benefits for custodians and bus drivers. This use was decided upon because it allowed those grant dollars to basically be spread further because a sizable assessment for state retirement contributions could be avoided. Had the funds instead been used for teacher salaries and benefits, a 20% retirement assessment would have reduced the overall value of the grant money received. It was only when questioning the large decrease in the FY 2014 school subsidy for Scarborough was it discovered that the idiosyncrasies of the EPS formula generated unfavorable subsidy calculations and basically compounded the loss of state funds to the Scarborough schools. Uh, quick action was taken, but despite the best efforts of state legislators, school board members, and district staff, the uh, State Department of Education officials res responded quite definitively saying there would be no reconsideration given and that there was no recourse for the town. So in other words, it was a done deal. This then essentially became water under the bridge, having come full circle in this EPS whirlpool that started back in 2010. A done deal, if you will, and all a month or so before the school board and the town council even started their conversation related to the 2014 school budget. A conversation that I think we all agreed was not focused on revenues, but rather on controlling expenditures. One last side note about EPS before getting back to the proposed budget amendment here. Um, the confusion and consternation about EPS formula has been so widespread across the state and so vocal that the legislature last year appropriated funding for an independent review of essential programs and services, the EPS formula, to be conducted by Lawrence P uh, Pikus and Associates out of Cal uh, Hollywood, California, to the tune of $450,000. A preliminary report was submitted by Picus and Associates on April 1st of this year. Yes, a April 1st, April Fool's Day. Um, but I am not joking when I tell you that the preliminary report is 231 pages long. And no, I've not read the report, and I will wait instead for the executive summary. When I started, I mentioned that there is some good news for Scarborough, unanticipated, but good news nonetheless and why we were just recently forewarned not to expect that the new revenues that we would get um, would cover the cost shift to the town for teacher retirement costs, the EPS calculations have again surprised us. This time, it's a favorable surprise. As best we can figure it out, um, an adjustment in the way that special education subsidy is now being calculated across the state has contributed at least to some of the favorable adjustment. I've been asked to convey um, that it is the school board's desire to settle the expense obligation, again, that the manager referenced, which is the $520,000 retirement um, cost shift to us. And while it's tempting to request that the positive balance um, that, would be, that, that exists after paying that, that cost uh, be applied to restoring programs and services that have been removed from the budget, Instead, and in response to those who wish for lower taxes, the board proposes that the balance of more than a quarter of a million dollars be applied to reduce property taxes. So here's the detail, basically, of the amendment proposal. It is to accept the 
uh, $38 in new state subsidy that was um, put through intended to help towns offset the main PERS, which is the teacher retirement expense for Scarborough. It's to essentially authorize an expenditure of approximately $520,283, which is the cost shift from the state of the, the, a, a portion of the uh, teacher retirement cost that was, used to be paid by the state um, and is now coming to uh, the town. So that's the new expense that's passed on from the state to the town. And to apply the balance, the 260, approximately $267,755 um, after the expense is paid um, to reduce property taxes. So uh, for the record um, and, uh, and for, the, for the public, um, the, the request is as follows. Uh, whereas the state legislature has approved additional allocation to general purpose aid to the Scar uh, Scarborough School Department in the amount of $788,038 for fiscal year 2014, and whereas these revenues were not included in the Scarborough School Department's approved budget for 2014, and whereas the legislature has enacted a new mandate that local school districts pay a portion of teacher retirement costs through Maine PERS, and whereas by agreement with the council this expenditure was not included in the school department's approved budget for FY 2014, and whereas the supplemental state aid is sufficient to pay the new retirement costs that the school department will owe, and and reduce taxes necessary for the 2014 school budget as previously authorized by the town council and ratified at town referendum. And whereas if the budget is not supplemented to reflect the additional required expenses and additional state aid, the tax commitment will exceed the amount required and the school department nonetheless will need to make further cuts to education in order to meet its new retirement benefit cost obligation. And whereas in the judgment of the Scarborough Board of Education, these facts constitute an emergency within the meaning of Section 11488 of Title 20A of the Maine Revised Statutes as amended, um, therefore, um, the, the Board of Education has basically asked me to come forward and request to you, the Council, that the school department budgeted FY 2014 revenues be increased by the amount of 788 um, $788,038, which is the sum, um, which is the sum, uh, this sum is the amount in which uh, the state aid was increased since the budget was originally adopted, and that the school department budgeted FY 2014 expenditures also be increased uh, by $520,283, which amount is the estimated cost of the school department's portion of teacher retirement costs, which costs were not included in the final school budget, that the additional local funds uh, um, amount raised for the school department FY 2014 budget be reduced by uh, $267,755, which amount is the balance of the additional state aid available to offset property taxes necessary for the school budget that the following ratification question be submitted to the voters of the town at a duly called special budget meeting, validation referendum, under the provisions of section 1488 title uh, 20A of the Maine Revised Statutes. That question reading, do you favor approving the amendment to the Scarborough school budget for the upcoming school year that was adopted by the town council at its meeting, and then with the date of your meeting inserted? and that pursuant to section 1486 of Title 20A, the superintendent consult with the town manager and town clerk regarding the information to be displayed at the polling places to assist voters in voting and that describes the proposed changes to the school budget, including the additional state subsidy of $788,038, the additional expenditure for the passed on new cost of a teacher retirement of $520,283 and um, re uh, uh, application uh, of the balance, the $267,755 to go to reduction in property taxes. That completes my presentation. Thank you. Let's get a motion. I move table. approval of order 1358. Second. 
Nope, sorry, wrong one. What is it? 1357. 1357. Sorry. Second. Anybody? Second. Discussion? Yes, I I've got to several questions. Um, first of all, just for clarification for the public on um, the um, main peers, the um, the teacher. The teacher, him or herself, pays into it, correct? That's correct. And then the uh, the town doesn't pay into it, but the state does. That's that's correct. This is a new cost that is being incurred by the town. Right. I just want because yep. I don't think they understand that Scarborough hasn't. The town itself didn't pay into their retirement system. The state did that portion. That's that's, that's correct. exactly right. This yep. this new five hundred and twenty thousand dollars. Um, yep. which is basically a projection based on current staff right now. It changes every time a staff person would change. But it's approximately $520,000 is a new expense that has, was previously paid by the state right. and is now being sent to the towns to pay. Right. Okay. The um, next question I have is to the town manager on, um, on it, w when this goes out to referendum, uh, if this is... Uh, if this is voted down, what are the consequences? Well, there's, there is a duly adopted budget. Um, I suppose there is a consequence of doing nothing and living within the current appropriation. Um, the council is free to certainly continue to go back to the voters until you uh, get a satisfactory vote. So it would be um, the, the, <clears throat> the question as it stands, uh, voted on without change every time? I, I beg or your pardon, I'm not sure if I answered the question. Like, if, it, if it was voted if it down, failed, would we fails, mix correct. up the numbers a little bit and bring them back differently, the same it, number? Uh, it, it would seem to me um, you'd be foolish to go to the voters without uh, modifying the request. Uh, in fact, to date, I believe every time uh, we have a a failed validation vote. Okay. There have been adjustments depending oh. on uh, often the advice given um, too high, right. too low. So that's if you what will. I was trying to get at. It would be I, reduced. I'm not sure if that's a requirement of state law. I just, I'm just reporting that's been the right. history and it would seem reasonable that there should be some adjustment or you'll get the same result. Okay. Well, I'm just trying to, this is for the public mm -hmm. too. Um, and then, um, the, okay, this is uh, mandated by the state that we have this vote. Um, it's not something that the council can dispose at, at our will. No, we've researched this thoroughly, uh, and really the single issue that causes uh, the need for further voter validation is the additional appropriation. The fact that we're receiving additional revenues in and of itself does not necessitate the voter validation, but the fact that uh, there is additional expense that was not provided for does. So by the state not getting their act together, we're going to, I mean, uh, this election is going to cost right around 10? I would defer to the thousands? town clerk uh, in that respect. Three. Oh, three? Okay, good. I, I wasn't sure because I've heard that figure thrown around. But okay, that ends my questions. Thank you. So just to be clear again, uh, by law, this has to go out to a vote yes. to the public. It does. If the voters turn it down, we can go out again, or what happens to the money? Can we put the money into taxpayer budget? When you say the money, relief? Uh, well, the what's money for certain is that we have a bill uh, of 528283 that was not anticipated in the budget. So that bill will have to be paid. Whether you raise additional funds um, to do so is a matter of discussion. The additional revenue that we receive, the 788038, uh, from an accounting point of view, that would be received as excess revenue, unanticipated revenue. I don't see, in fact, I, I, that would not be available for tax relief in FY14. It would show up after audit uh, in the fund balance as unexpended funds, and then theoretically as fund balance, it certainly could be used for tax relief purposes. So I just want to be clear that that money, should you do nothing, mm -hmm. uh, that money is not available for tax relief in FY14. Uh, it would be after the books are closed and the audit is complete. Right, next year. Right, Council Sullivan. Just one. Um, the this is the acceptance 
according to this, is going through the uh, school board. Well, so is the, the money so allocated to the schools, not to the town? Well, what was just read, what you're looking right. at yeah. was the school board action. That is not what's in front of you this evening. I think that was read just to put into context what the school board sentiment okay. was. Um, right. So I'm sorry, ask your question again. Uh, who actually accepts the 788038? <laughs> From a, a legal point of view, I... I the it's, it's, mo it's, money that's, the it's, it's money that is allocated as school subsidy. It comes to the town. That's, so that is, this is, uh, this is allocated as a school subsidy, a 788038. Uh, there's more money than that, but that's the additional subsidy, correct? That, that's uh, earmarked in, in, from the state as, as uh, school funding? Yes, money? we couldn't use it to pave streets, if, that, okay. if that's, uh, that's an easy way to understand it. Yep. Yes. Okay. Thank you. The, uh, our finance chair, Councilor Roy, is uh, going to say a few comments. I am. <laughs> <laughs> I've never Ow. seen you when you couldn't, so <laughs> I assume finance chair, you have to say something. No, not really. Um, just basically that the finance committee is going to meet next Tuesday. We're kind of, you know, just looking towards the future. But there's a couple other things, I guess, you know, I'm, the thought, I was discussing it with a manager or just, other ways in which we could reduce the tax burden is to look at the unexpended fund balance of the town as a whole and whether or not we wanted to use any of that. I don't know where we are with that. Uh, we have a policy that maintains it at a, a, at a certain level. It can't exceed, a certain, I think, 8.9% and, it, and its policy says it shouldn't go below 5.2. Um, and I don't know where we are with that. So those are some other things that we might think about as we go forward to the second reading. Um, and then I think the other thing we want to think about as far as tax relief for the, for the residents is the uh, tax assessor has not set the, the increased value of the town as yet, um, although we looked at it as we went through the budget process. Currently in the budget, the manager has um, put it in as a $15 million increase in tax value, correct? And, and that's simply for uh, conversation purposes. Yeah. That is. Yeah. Uh, the, the and assessor's so responsibility. That still, the assessor still has to complete his work, and there may be some adjustments there. So there's mm -hmm. there's still some avenues out there, perhaps for a little more tax relief. Uh, I, you know, I'm, I've heard from one particular resident who is in dire straits, trying to keep their own, you know, their home. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of people out there that need some relief. So. Um, but we, I, I think we'd be foolish not to. Except a proposal from the school board, certainly, that we apply this to the unexpended fund balance because that's the issue. So, so logistics-wise, our next meeting is if we approve the first reading tonight, then our second reading would come up uh, August 21st. So do we need a special meeting? I, uh, you suggesting that maybe? We, I didn't uh, want to get ahead of myself, but I would strongly suggest you do hold a special meeting for purposes of taking up this sole matter. So I appreciate it's summertime. We don't want to meet. but. In the interest of getting this back out to the voters, uh, uh, the ideal date from staff's point of view would be a special meeting on July 31st, and that would put us in position for the validation vote on August 13. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense to everybody? Uh, any questions about that? It would be a quick meeting, brief. It would yeah. be a single item. A single item. Actually, public hearing as well. That's right. We would look to accomplish public hearing and second reading um, all on uh, July 31st. There would be a secondary piece to actually uh, establish the date of the election and to approve the ballot language. Uh, the school board has offered some suggestion in that regard, but it is the responsibility of council to do that. So we'd look to do that at that evening as well. All right. So special meeting July 31st would be the second reading. And the vote would be August 13th. Correct. We clear with that. Uh, Councilor Blaze. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to go back to your explanation of what happened with those federal funds. I mean, you, you, it's a complicated thing. You've got to, you've got to make it as clear as possible because there's a lot of people mm -hmm. listening tonight, wanting to know what the explanation was. And who is at fault? Uh, I don't, I, can I, I kind of right. go through the whole thing again? Sure. I, I don't know that there's anybody at fault. Um, I do know that um, 
um, and it's really it's my understanding of what happened. It was in 2010 that decisions were made. All districts received um, additional funding. It was part of the surplus that was distributed. It came in the form of federal jobs funds. It was basically to uh, preserve um, pr preserve jobs, um, and districts um, basically took the guidance from the state, which basically had the authority to um, administer these federal funds, as Scarborough did. When they looked at how best to use those funds, they thought it would be in the best interest of the town to apply those funds to jobs that did not require the additional assessment of retirement. So in other words, it's about a 20% markup uh, for retirement contribution. So if you, if you basically fund jobs that don't have the requirement for retirement, then in fact those dollars are going further. And that's but what... But you already, you just, you just told us that we were not, we're not responsible for the retirement of the teachers. No, no, there is... Okay. What's that? This, is a, this is a unique string attached, attached with the federal money. Um, what the, what the uh, finance manager is saying is that um, because it's federal money, we would be responsible. So essentially, it was a decision made by the board at the time to, to fund jobs that were, did not ha carry with it the retirement obligation thereby not paying the 20% and using those dollars to spread them further. Um, there was nothing indicated by the, the state at the time that was providing guidance and basically approving the use of the, the funds. So the, the state approved mm -hmm. the use of the funds for the school bus driver? That's correct. And, and, and basically there was, there was no um, forewarning at that time that the use of funds would, when run through the EPS formula, would basically backfire, if you will, or uh, basically re result in uh, not really saving the money and, in fact, compounding and losing, generating a higher loss of subsidy because of the way that the funds were used. Did did other towns experience the same problem? I believe that there are other towns that did experience the same problem. I think that, um, you know, the, there are other, this, is, this has happened all across the country because all of the states receive federal jobs funds. And I know, I was in Massachusetts at the time, and I believe that that was a f fully um, appropriate use for, f for funds um, uh, in Massachusetts, of course, Massachusetts does not have an EPS formula that, when calculated, comes back and sort of, um, you know, uh, cuts your subsidy. That's, I have to say, it's not how I use them in Massachusetts, but I believe that there were o certainly other districts that did, and because it was a different state, because they did not have an EPS, they were not penalized. Uh, Another question, the 520,000, uh, is that going to be an ongoing annual amount? Yes. Or is this just for the next two years? It is, it is, it is, a, ch it is a change in who gets the bill. Well, it certainly is true. It's tied to this biennial state budget, so it's possible. Like this law was changed, the oh, law could be sure. changed again. The law changes. Yeah. For certain, it's in place for the next two years. I think there are just two salient points um, that I hope will further clarify. It wasn't until February this this year, 13, that this was even made. We were even made aware of this issue. Is my understanding um, when we first started our they first started to ask questions as to why is our subsidy so much lower this year than it was last right. year. Uh, the other important point is that this is kind of a one-time one pain. Uh, the effect of it will has affected the subsidy for fiscal year 14. Uh, it will not affect us uh, in the same sort of way in future calculations. Right. The, the, the impact is a one-time impact, um, and, then it, and then it goes away. 
in terms of how the, how the federal jobs funds were used. That was, we felt that this year and will not feel that again. It basically runs through, it runs through the cycle and it's done. One time, that's it. Correct. Yeah. Anybody else? This is the first reading, so we'll have a second reading. Uh, just, just to thank the uh, superintendent for his explanation. I think that will be helpful. And certainly, yep. if there are other questions, they certainly can contact us as counselors or contact the school department, mm -hmm. school board members, yep. if they need further clarification. That is helpful. Thank you. Yes, Good. Thank you. All those in favor? Opposed? Opposed? It's a vote. Order Next number 1358 is act to authorize the town manager to sign an authorization for entry with the Army Corps of Engineers relating to the dredging of the Scarborough River uh, Federal Navigation Project. Yes, very uh, briefly by way of introduction, I'm very pleased to have uh, yeah. helped secure uh, about three million dollars uh, in federal FEMA funding to help dredge the Scarborough River. Um, as a footnote, this money was uh, part of the Sandy um, Hurricane Sandy authorization, um, and we became eligible as a result of. Uh, it's been a project on the books, uh, but lacking funding. So that's really what, what's responsible. We've been moving very, very quickly to move uh, this project. Uh, up the line in terms of getting it done as soon as possible. Uh, federal law requires certain times of the year only where dredging can occur, and that takes into account um, shellfish and other marine life um, and such. Uh, that period is generally from October to April of each year, so we're working feverishly to meet that window this year. As part of that, uh, we've been asked to, uh, in partnership with the Army Corps of Engineers, to allow access, entry and access through Ferry Beach, if you will, the parking lot. Um, a great benefit of this dredge project is not only will we get the dredge accomplished, but the dredge spoils will be pumped up onto Western Beach, which is the beach that fortifies Presnet Golf Club, uh, who uh, in that area, if you're familiar with it, has uh, sustained tremendous erosion damage um, historically and most importantly uh, through this winter, these winter storms had been particularly harsh to the point that there was actually a breach and the, the fairways flooded with seawater. Long story short, uh, to accommodate the dredge project and the beach nourishment project, uh, the contractors will be looking for access across and through our lands to access Western Beach. And on the other side of the river, uh, closest to the co-op and the pier, they're looking to stage some of their construction material and equipment, if you will. So this authorization for entry um, allows that temporary construction access at those two locations to accomplish the work. Thank you. Pleasure of the council. Move approval. Second. Second. Any questions? All those in favor? It's a vote. Thank you. Non-action items. We have none, I believe. Um, standing committees, special reports, Council Roy. Um, not a lot of meetings, that's good. Um, and the only thing that I attended uh, recently, well, it was June 27th, I attended a PACS workshop uh, where we talked about selecting the, how the uh, projects are selected for the application of the $13 million in federal funds that, uh, that PACS receives. Um, and um, basically, uh, some of the major things that came out of that um, is not specifically focusing on projects that expands the numbers of roads, but expands alternative transit choices. Um, really looking at bus service and, and uh, rail service and uh, those kinds of things. So it was kind of an interesting workshop. Energy Committee will be meeting uh, tomorrow uh, at 7.30. We'll be talking about the Trigen model and about some videos, I hope. I think that meeting has been canceled. Has it? Oh, I didn't see that. As of late today. Okay. Yeah. I didn't see that email, so that's a good. And that's it. Council Holbrook. <coughs> the appointments committee met this evening. Um, we have two names to post. We have for the planning board um, for a second alternate position with a term to expire in 2013 is Nicholas McGee, as well as um, for the ad hoc historic preservation committee, we have Craig Frederick. Oh, nice. And those will come up on our August 21st. Mm -hmm. 
town council meeting. Yes, um, we do have several vacancies on various boards and committees. We have openings on the Board of Assessment Review. Um, there are two openings. Cable Television has five openings. Coastal Waters and Harbor Committee has two openings. Community Services and Recreation has one opening. Energy Committee has one opening. Um, the Parks and Conservation Land Board has one opening. And the Personal Appeals Board has three openings. Um, so if anybody is interested, please come contact the clerk's office if you're interested in serving on any of our committees. Um, and then Housing Alliance. Housing Alliance met on um, it was July 11th. Um, they had continued discussion on um, and an update on the Habitat Project on Broad Turn Road. Um, we will be partnering with Habitat to um, make progress and start the um, there is a noise study that needs to be performed before the um, community block grant can be distributed to us. Um, so they're going to get moving and um, proceed with that. Um, and then at our next meeting, um, they will be discussing the um, or, uh, order that was tabled at our last council meeting. Good. Thank you. Can I just add on the energy committee, uh, we'll, we'll be doing, uh, we will, we'd like to set up a workshop for the council prior to, I don't know whether it'll be August or September. So Probably September, um, I think. But uh, we're ready to, you know, to update you on the process of the Trigen project, uh, cost and, you know, its, uh, its uh, benefits and its ROI and, um, and I think it, it, it will be, it will be good. We, we need to move forward on it because we are receiving grant money from the efficiency main of $216,000, so we have to be continually. Well, maybe we can try to do that in September meeting. Yep. Okay. Council Sullivan. On July 2nd, uh, Ordinance Committee met. Uh, we discussed the uh, ban on public urination along with um, disrobing in public. Um, that's been tabled. Um, property tax deferral for seniors, um, we're working on that. Um, building design standards and requirements, um, that's still uh, working on, not being forward yet. And also telecommunications with the um, um, cell phone uh, towers um, where there's dead zones and um, what they need from <coughs> us to uh, be helpful in uh, resolving that because, uh, you know, 10 years ago people um, were opposed to cell phone towers and now that the um, cell phones have taken over and uh, smartphones, 3G, 4G, um, there's become a change of heart on that from the general public. So we're um, looking into that. Um, some new items that we're taking, we'll be probably taking up at the next meeting is uh, septic design and standards. Um, and then for the Transportation Committee meeting, will be uh, next Tuesday night, the 23rd. And uh, I have no idea what the agenda is now yet, I don't believe. Um, the ordinance committee, next ordinance committee meeting, um, hasn't been scheduled yet. Um, I think uh, we'll have to get back to you on that. I, I think it would be probably the 30th okay. of uh, this month. Okay. This month? Uh, of July? Of July, yeah. The second was a makeup. July 2nd was a makeup. So um, I'm going to check with. Um, Dan and um, staff to see if uh, the 30th um, thing gets stuff prepared by then. If not, then uh, I'll uh, contact everybody and reschedule. Thank you, Councilor St. Clair. Hey, I don't have any. All my committees were just reporting on. Awesome, Councilor Blaze. Um, yeah, I, I've got a couple items. One. Um, the employee incentive program is off and flying. Um, 
I don't think I'm um, privy to discussing uh, an item that has come up, but uh, I will say that the very first suggestion that was brought forward could have a huge potential savings to the town. Right. That's all I'm going to say about that. But anyway, the, uh, the committee has met. Uh, the town has, uh, all the town managers have folded out the uh, program to the employees. Uh, and they're slowly receiving suggestions. So hopefully it will be a very successful program. Uh, the second item is uh, Councillor Sullivan said that the public urination discussion was tabled and what we did is we, there was a group of people, myself, uh, uh, Tom Hall, uh, Chief Moulton, and who else was there? there was you were there. Yes. And you were there, right? Yes. And a lot of we, people there. Yeah, we there did, yeah there. a lot of people there. We discussed, we discussed the issue in, in uh, great detail, and we decided that initially the best thing to do is to try public uh, uh, education. And one of the things that Chief Moulton came up with is a little folder here that uh, discusses everything that you can do and not do at the public beaches, all public beaches, not only Higgins Beach, but all public beaches. And uh, what he's done, and it, if they've already been down there, the VIPs are going down one or two nights a week and also on the weekends, uh, walking along the beach, handing these out, talking to people about what they, sh you know, what they should be doing and what they shouldn't be doing. Um, talking to the people that are parking down there, where the problem is really arising. So hopefully, we're going to see some improvements, and we're just going to monitor that until the end of the season, and then make a decision from there. Great, thank you, Councilor Benedict. Um, we had a rules of policies meeting this evening. Prior to this, uh, just went over two things. We had a discussion on uh, rules of policies manual relating to the town council holding an annual workshop mm -hmm. to review the current committees and boards. We took policies out of it and just left it at the current committees and boards to be taking place the first quarter of the year so that we could be all up to speed with what everybody's doing, accomplishing, not accomplishing, necessary and unnecessary. Uh, the other thing, there was a basic discussion was a proper approach to review the pest management policy and we'll basically push that off till September uh, when we can have some professional help with what's going on in the field, what's good and what's bad and where we need to tweak. And that was the extent of the meeting. And the Coastal Harbors had a meeting earlier this month, um, summertime, wasn't too well attended, it was maybe five including Dave Cabo, and they just went over uh, some of the business with clamming flats. And uh, one thing that did come up that I was glad to hear was uh, the woman that, that rented the spot for something to do with a clamming business uh, has been working very successfully. There's been no, no problems, no anything uh, of bad. Uh, so it was a good decision on our part to let that, let that take place. And uh, then they were talking about the uh, very extenuous cleanup uh, that they do during the summer. And uh, as part of having a boat in the water, you've got to spend so many hours in cleanup, which uh, I don't know how many people knew. 
and if you don't, you lose your rights to put your boat in the water. So they were just going over that and who had what hours, where they were coming, where they were going, and that was the extent of that one. That's all I have. Thank you. Town Manager's report. Yes, a couple quick items. Uh, quickly on project updates, uh, we are well underway with the observation deck at the field house down here at the turf field. You can drive by and see it. Uh, the, the roof line has been modified. Uh, the rubber membrane is down as of today, so it's watertight, we're pleased to say, and, and on schedule. Uh, and it, there's virtually been no disruption with activities down uh, at the turf field and, and down at the athletic complex. The Dunstan project is about a week um, behind schedule. Um, it's going to be the end of July before it's complete. The good news is all the work is night work, so the disruptions are minimal. I, I'll say I, at least my phone has not rung. Uh, in the last couple of nights, uh, they appear to have put a lot of pavement down. Um, and just anecdotally, I happen to go through that intersection two or three or four times a day. Uh, it, it appears to be functioning much better and, and as it was anticipated. So. Um, the other project we're uh, fully operational with is the Jap Jasper Street uh, reconstruction that involves all drainage, um, uh, water and sewer line being replaced, not all by the town, but uh, we've coordinated that as part of this project. So, uh, And it connects to the new Jasper Street uh, as part of the Sea Ridge subdivision. So we appreciate uh, those residents' patience as we work to complete that work as, as quickly as we can. Uh, a couple of other updates, uh, FEMA flood maps, um, I, I mention this now, there's no new news, in fact, uh, the preliminary release date is sometime late fall. Uh, I mention it because I did an interview with MPBN Radio today, I'm not sure why it's newsworthy to them at this point, but uh, you may hear my voice on the radio if you tune in to one show. Uh, dogs on the beach may be an issue, I'll just <laughs> kind of alert the council. Once uh, every four years, whether we need to or not. There has certainly been heightened interest on the part of uh, inland fisheries and wire, wildlife for us to reconsider our current regulations with dogs on the beach. Um, this past Sunday morning, there was an incident at Pine Point Beach uh, whereby a dog um, unleashed, uh, actually killed a piping plover chick, which uh, is an endangered species. So there's a, a manhunt of sorts going on to identify the dog owner. Uh, this is pretty serious business, a breach of federal law. Uh, so I mentioned it in passing, um, I think there will be some heightened interest on the part of uh, Maine Audubon and others to perhaps bring this issue back to the council. Mm -hmm. uh, another product of the state budget was changes to the, their circuit breaker program. Historically, uh, there have been eligibility standards. Those have been changed and frankly um, um, strengthened, so it's a bit harder to be eligible for the state program. Um, as important, they've also severely reduced the total amount that a resident, eligible resident can receive. Uh, the maximum award used to be 16, up to $1,600. It's now $300 for those 70 and under and 400 potential for those 70 and older. Uh, it doesn't appear we need to do anything with our local circuit breaker program. Uh, it does, our local program does require eligibility first with the states. Um, I mention it because since their standards have changed, it may be that not as many people are eligible. So that's something uh, one of the committees may want to take a look at um, in the coming months. Well, it has to be changed. Our program's got to be changed. It doesn't have to. The require uh, we're simply tied to their eligibility. So to the extent they change their eligibility, it doesn't necessarily, as a matter of procedure, uh, know, affect yeah, us. But it may affect. Eligible. Uh, the total number that are then eligible for our program. But my only observation is we don't, it's not, an, it's not essential that we change it, but we may want to. Uh, I had mentioned some weeks or months back to the council, we're looking at doing some slight uh, reconfiguration of the clerk's office. Town clerk's office um, will be um, rearranged in such a way that the public will access immediately off the front <coughs> hall, opposite door, um, the door that exists has just been shut, uh, a door that's opposite the collections window, and we think that will be easier for the public to um, find out where they're going. That's going to require some interior renovation, as you might expect. I believe the furnishings in there are original to uh, the building, so they're about 20 years old. Uh, 
to accommodate the clerk's office, that office obviously needs to function. We're going to relocate them to Chamber B for about a two and a half week period. Uh, they're accustomed at election time in operating out of those chambers, and we've cleared uh, meeting meetings, uh, relocated them, so they'll be able to have access there for that entire period. And the public really should not even notice that the work's going on other than having to report here for service. Uh, lastly, just a reminder, uh, McDonald's um, down the street here has their grand opening this Friday at 10.30 in the morning. I know Councilor Roy is going to appear, I hope, um, since I see her on the agenda. Um, <laughs> just an observation, that project was uh, fairly incredible start to finish. They yeah. appear to have worked uh, two and three shifts through the night to, to uh, get that project open. And um, it was mentioned earlier, design standards. Um, uh, this is a subjective opinion, but I, I really uh, like the way it looks. I think um, a fair amount of that final product is a result of the planning board working with them on design. Um, and lastly, just an appeal to, first to the council, but more importantly to our residents, um, our friends north of the border in Lake uh, Lac Megantic, I guess it's Lac the yep, it is. Megantic, um, have obviously right. suffered a tremendous tragedy. Uh, there's still um, lost souls that they have not identified uh, yet, but it could be as upwards of 50 people. And from a town perspective, something like five square blocks are simply decimated in the middle of their town. So they've obviously got some real challenges. Interestingly enough, uh, the town of Farmington, Maine, is their sister city, and they have partnered with TD Bank and have created a relief fund. So with that <coughs> permission, I'd like to at least make this available as a link through our website. Uh, and should residents wish to participate on their own, um, it's there for their, for them. Yep. Go ahead. Thank you. Councilor comments. Councilor Sullivan. Well, I don't have a lot tonight, but hearing about the circuit breaker um, program, I think that's pretty shameful what the state did. Um, it's pretty. It's. it's um, I meant that's going to. Um, a lot of our um, seniors that are on fixed incomes and it's I think it's funny that we're going to end up giving them more than the state does right. and we can afford it less least than the state so um, that's shameful and um, but I guess the, the whole deal with the uh, what went on up the state house this year was incredible being, you know, um, late with their budget and just the shenanigans that are going on out there. But um, like I said, I'll end my comments with that tonight. Councilor Holbrook. Uh, <clears throat> just kind of an interesting note um, for those of you that don't know or are familiar with. Um, Scarborough hosts once a year um, in the summer months um, annually the Tranche Montaigne Tournament, and that will be happening um, this month the 27th um, and that's kind of a big thing for the wrestling community um, and it's quite a thing to see so many folks show up. Um, also again on a wrestling note they are um, the charity of the month at Clink so anything that shows up at Clink this month without a designated tag goes to the boosters. Um, and um, there's something else but I forgot so. <laughs> that happens. <laughs> Don't Roy. Oh. Um, just I forgot to mention, a uh, finance committee is meeting next Tuesday. I had mentioned it earlier, and we're going to talk about our strategies for next year's budget and start you know, working on it now, and then we'll talk a little bit about tonight's action on the budget. And so, um, Also, um, the uh, Open House for the Horizon Solutions was held in June, and I did attend that in the building. That's the first building on the parkway and the... Uh, Hopefully there will be more to follow. Um, I want to thank Kevin for his comments about the, um, the memorial areas. And I think that's the biggest factor that we were trying to get at with just the policy, keeping it clean and keeping it neat and honoring and respecting. Uh, and uh, hopefully that will happen. Um, and the other thing, uh, SEDCO has moved. I think may, you may all have received an email, but Karen said stop in any time. They are down at the corner of Willowdale and Route 1. Uh, 
And uh, certainly my condolences out to the Lake Megantic. I have many relatives in that area. I haven't seen a list yet, but I have a number of relatives that uh, live in Lake Megantic. Uh, and the circuit breaker, I, if we could get the information of what has changed, what the guidelines are so that we can look at ours and figure out something different. Um, and then I have a very long list of people who have passed because I didn't do the list in June, um, but uh, I always like to recognize and to, to offer condolences out to the friends and family of the folks. Um, so Gregory Cole, uh, Ralph Tim, Angela Jan Jania, uh, Alicia Wade, who was a resident at CASA, Joanne Greenlaw, Joan Willis, and then there were 11 of our uh, World War II veterans that passed away at the Veterans Home, and most all of them were 95 and older. Um, Earl Maxwell, Kenneth Phillips, David Watson, Emil Gagnon, Boyd Brown, Odie Trudeau, Paul Karras, George Mulcahy, who had just celebrated his hundredth, um, James Keller, Louis Terrio, and John Olson. Thank you. Councilor Bennett? I have nothing to say. Councilor Blake? No comment. <coughs> Um, I'll, be, I'll also be at the McDonald's opening. <laughs> Anybody's wondering. I am not on the agenda, but I will be there. You can take my place. No, 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 no. Get you on if you like. No, 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 no. It's really, it's fine. <laughs> Some kids that are really excited that's opening again. They, they've been packed. What? Yeah. They've oh, just been okay. Yeah. Um, that's it. That's all I had. Okay. Thank you. Council Holbrook uh, had a. Councilor Roy moment, but she's back. I did. I remembered what I was going to say. Um, just a friendly reminder to folks, um, because they're free concerts, and it's nice to go do something and well, not have to spend a lot of money, but um, concerts in the park are in full swing. Um, this Thursday is Motor Booty. That tends to be a pretty pretty popular one with folks. Um, so again, you're looking for something to do with your family and not really have to spend any money other than maybe an ice cream cone on a hot summer evening, but it's always a good time. Thursday evening. Yeah. Last week was 60s Inspiration. Uh, inspiration or some, I think someone, they were from the Boston area. They were excellent. And I won the 50 50. Mm -hmm. oh. She's buying the ice cream. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I gave Uncle them Roy I gave the money back. Uncle Roy is buying the ice cream this yeah. week. <laughs> I gave them the money back. That's the headline. Um, it back. <laughs> <laughs> my comments, I appreciate uh, Kevin. Grandin coming here tonight and, and his comments. We had a nice discussion before the meeting and he agrees and we talked about, you know, what we need is guidelines and that's all we tried to do as a council is offer some kind of guidelines to people who are in that, in that position. So he had some uh, really good input and I certainly appreciate it. Uh, we all do as a council. Um, the other thing I just wanted to say is the plovers, dogs on the beach, I'm, I'm ready to bring that up for discussion again. I'm ready. It's uh, <laughs> unfortunate that happened in the past. It's uh, uh, it's always been a pretty heated debate. People feel strongly about their dogs, but certainly the plovers, I, I think they probably trump the dogs on this one. So I'm okay with that, bringing that up. The last thing is, I guess everybody enjoy your summer. It's been a good month so far. So, And don't forget our special meeting is going to be July 31. 30. July 31. Mm -hmm. yep. And we'll. Motion to adjourn. Yep. Second. Second. All those. Good night. Mm -hmm.